Okay, so today is about kinetics and equilibrium. We're going to spend more time on kinetics, but specifically on something called potential energy curves and the relationship they have with the flow of energy in or out of a chemical reaction. Now, we've already learned about exothermic and endothermic. We've learned about the temperature changes when you have an exothermic reaction and the temperature changes of the environment when it's endothermic. All those things are old hat. Yes, I don't expect you to know them off the top of your head, but hopefully we can retrieve them when I go through this process. Now, I've shown you parts of these things already, so hopefully we can bring this back to the forefront. So I have a demonstration today, okay? And in this demonstration, what I'm going to take is ethanol. All right, so you have a bottle of ethanol, which, by the way, is the same ethanol in wine, liquor, and beer, although this one is denatured, so I could not drink it, okay, meaning they added a small amount of methanol, which makes it toxic, okay, so don't expect me to take a swig of that, all right, but if I was to make a bottle of moonshine or someone with someone distill uh, in the local area, you have people distilling um, ethanol, okay, for instance, if you go to the North Fork, you'll see there's a uh, potato a vodka a barn, okay, and of course people um, ferment alcohol in terms of the, the using yeast and wine, especially in our area. In any case, I'm going to use its uh, combustion power. So ethanol, okay, C2H6O, reacts with oxygen to make CO2 and water. This is a combustion reaction. This is burning, okay, burning produces CO2 and water. And this, of course, is the fuel that reacts with oxygen. Okay, some motors work with ethanol. In fact, we now mix 10% of our gasoline with ethanol. Okay, for reasons I will get to another day. But, so this is certainly a fuel, it will burn. Okay, and certainly it's part of my demonstration. So what I'm gonna do is take a little bit of ethanol. Okay, and I should be having my safety glasses on. So take a little bit of ethanol. And I'm going to pour it into this little bulb here. It looks like an end of a turkey baster. Okay. And what I have is a hole in it. And inside I have another particular interesting piece of equipment that you may have seen before. It's a barbecue sparker. So I've got that connected to a wire. And if you can see, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little spark inside. Okay. That's what's going to start my reaction. So I'm going to take some alcohol vapors or at least I'm going to try to light the vapors. So I'm pouring some alcohol in here. I'm going to increase the surface area. I'm going to pour out the extra. Okay. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to essentially get this fill of alcohol vapors. Okay. I'm going to light the vapors. And I did this kind of a demonstration already with maybe if you remember the uh, wish bottle. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I've got my wire. And the spark is going to be something called the activation energy. And now I'm going to take my ping pong ball, stuff it in my bowl, and now I'm going hot. All right? I've got my ping pong launcher. Okay? Okay? Right. Who didn't do their homework? Okay. All right. Because ping pongs are dangerous. Although, you know, if I was to make this go very, very fast, it can be dangerous. It's called impulse. But in any case, I'm not going to shoot it at you, but let's see if I hit the sparker, if the little tiny spark that you saw was enough to start the overall reaction. So here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> Didn't expect that, did you? Okay. Okay. That was pretty violent. Okay. For a ping pong ball. Okay. Where's that ping pong? Let's go one more time. Oh, it's stuck in. All right. Cameron's got stuck in her eye socket. <laughs> Someone's drawing a drawing in the pupil. Okay, good throw. All right, so let's do this for the first time for Kara. Okay. Now, it's a little warm, so I'm trying to cool it down. I'm also trying to, if you notice, this is a very important chemical technique. I'm getting the oxygen back in because you notice I need the oxygen with the ethanol. Okay, now why did it push out the ping pong ball? What happened in the reaction? What must I have created? 
Well, I had, yeah, I definitely pressure pushed it out. And pressure is due to what phase of matter? Gases. So my friends, we produced gases, water vapor, and CO2. So you notice we have 10 moles of gases here. Okay, here we have, well, 10, 8 moles of gases, right? Notice I'm counting 2 and 6. So we created more gas, but it wasn't just more gas, right? We're creating more gas at the end than the beginning. What else was created to increase the pressure? How is pressure affected? How can we increase the pressure? What did we learn about gas laws? Temperature, yes, yes and yes. If you increase the temperature, what happens to a gas? Does it expand or contract? Right, it goes faster, so in this small little bulb, if it was to get warmer, okay, the gas inside that was created, okay, should expand. So, twofold here. Number one, we created more gas. Two, we actually released heat into the reaction vessel. We call this exothermic or endothermic? X right. When heat is exiting, it's exothermic. So we would say that this reaction is exothermic. Now my friends in chemistry, if you forgot, think of heat exiting. Here are my reactants. That's what I started with. Here are my products. Now, if I am producing heat along with these 10 moles of gas, where would I put the heat in my reaction? Would I put it on the reactant side or the product side? I'm producing heat. These are my reactants. These are my products. This bulb got warm. Because it got warm, the gases that were made in here expanded out and pushed out the what? The ping pong ball. So where do I put the heat? Where do you think? Product side. I'm producing the heat, so we can write plus E for energy. Now we could put in here, you know, uh, 20 kilo, kilo joules. We don't know what the energy is, but it can have some value. So exothermic means heat was released. Burning. Anytime I take a piece of paper and burn it, wood, burning anything, our combustion reaction and heat is always, always released. Okay, let's do it one more time. Again, it worked because I had some activation energy starting it. A little spark that created the entire reaction. A little tiny piece of energy was needed to start it. Now, it also works because spontaneously this will react with oxygen. Now that I have the oxygen, that's just a technique. Hold your hands at your side. Get the oxygen in. Okay. Now, pour some ethanol. Okay, another technique is you swirl. Okay, I'm going to get the extra out. Okay, just kind of get the sides here. Pour the extra out. Okay, I'm just trying to make it fill up full of alcohol vapors. Stuff my ping pong ball. Oh, it went in too deep. Okay. It's not going to work if it's that deep. Okay. <laughs> Premature ping pong ball. Okay. Now I might be flaming because now it's full of ethanol. Okay. So, just make sure my... Okay, cool. So here we go. Now we're hot. Or was I already? Okay. All right. So now I'm hot. All right. You ready? Okay, who did you do the homework? Okay, so here we go. <laughs> One, two, three. Where'd it go? Did it hit the ceiling? Alright. Don't know. Did it hit somebody? Did it bounce? And how, did it it, how, did, how did it go there, though? Yeah, how did it go there? Did it turn? I think it went around me. Don't know. Sure it cuts away. Oh, it's in someone's eye socket. Okay. So, 
Clearly this is warm, clearly the heat released, clearly the addition of extra gas molecules increased the pressure. So this is exothermic. Now what we're going to do now is we're going to plot the change of energy, we're going to call it potential energy. And the reason why we're going to use potential energy here is because the energy that you just witnessed, felt, saw, was afraid of, scared of, okay? from the ping pong ball, was there energy that came from the chemical bonds? Even though we saw a ping pong moving, that energy that moved the ping pong came from the potential of the ethanol. The ethanol has a potential to burn. Okay, I have it right here. Why isn't it starting to flame up right now? It has to be activated. There's something that's, that's needed to start this reaction. So we're gonna learn about potential energy curves. We're gonna show and plot the changes of potential energy throughout the reaction. Now this is for an exothermic, but pay attention. So, I have my reaction, and here's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna plot a change, oops, maybe not, okay, here we go. On this side, it's only a blue line, okay? But she doesn't like blue lines, okay. I'll go with the black now, okay? now. This is potential energy. Why? Because you're really plotting the, uh, the change of energy, okay, in, that really comes from the bonds. So potential energy, we'll just do POT. <laughs> really having some problems here, okay. So potential energy here. Okay, now, this is called time or reaction coordinate. We'll just, we'll just make this time. Okay, now, when we start a potential energy diagram, we have to evaluate the reactants. So, would you say that ethanol has high potential energy? Does it have potential to do something? Absolutely. You saw the what happens when you light, okay, or put a spark to ethanol in the presence of oxygen, it lights up. Okay, it combusts, it can, create, it can create pressure if it's enclosed. So clearly this has what kind of potential energy, high or low? Hot, hey, okay, so very high. And let's write the reactants here. The reactants are C2H6O. These, and of course we have to consider oxygen as well. So. If you think about the collective energy that you just witnessed that's stored in these chemical bonds, they have a lot of potential energy. Okay, now, the next part. What kind of potential energy do you think the products had? They had to be low if energy was released. Think about it. I'm going from high energy, I have to go to low in order to release energy. You saw the energy released. So if I'm losing some of my potential energy, what's left has to be lower. It's totally logical. We're not memorizing, we're understanding. So I'm gonna draw that my products are lower in potential energy. Why? Because energy was given off in the reaction. So CO2, oops, let's make it nice and neat, CO2, and water vapor collectively have low potential energy. So when you look at a potential energy curve, the absolute first thing you look at is where you start and where you finish. Because I'm finishing lower, I know, okay, that this energy was given off and this is an exothermic curve. Energy went down. How'd it go down? Because energy was released. Had to, had to be, you, all right? Things that have high energy are going to do something. You go into the city, you see that guy at the train station, right? He's got high energy. Do you look him into the face and say, how you doing today? No. Probably should ask him how he's doing, but I guess you should walk on by because maybe someone with that kind of high energy is going, is about to do something, okay? So, High energy means you're going to do something. Things that burn, explode, are going to give off heat, have this high stored energy. Now, 
What is something we learn? Well, my friends in chemistry, what is the energy that's released? And this is important. I'll notice how I said it. Okay? The difference of where you start and where you finish is the next thing you have to look at. The first thing I look at is the start and the finish. I'm going down in energy. That must be energy released. But the question is, how much? So this is important. The difference of where you start and where you finish is an important factor here. Okay? So I don't know if you can see this, so I'll write it here. So this red line is the difference of where you start and finish. It's the change of the overall energy. So we're going to call this a delta sign. Delta means change. It's a triangle. And we're going to call it the change of H, or the change of heat. Okay? It's also called enthalpy. It's got a fancy name. So when you say enthalpy, pinky up. Or if you just want to sound smart, you just drop something like enthalpy. Yeah, I was studying enthalpy. Okay. My stoichiometry. That's right. Okay? So you just drop some things that no one knows and just say it. Now, so this is my change in overall energy. My friends in chemistry, this change is going to be the exact energy listed in the reaction. So if I was a princess and we had some numbers up here, let's make up some numbers. Okay, let's make this 100. Let's make this line equal to, let's say, 40. Can anyone guess what the change of H is? I started at 100 potential energy and now I'm down to 40. The black point? line is supposed to hit this red line. Thanks. <laughs> that's why I say, imagine I'm a princess and this works out, okay? So yeah, let's pretend that's, that's right there. So what's my value for delta H? It is not 60. It is not 60. Not 40. What? Someone said it. Not 60. 60 is wrong. Negative 60 is right. I cannot accept 60. 60 is positive. 60 means my change went up 60. I need to have a negative that shows me it went down 60. You're amazing in your own area. <laughs> Just don't leave it. <laughs> amazing? Not amazing. Okay? Okay. Now, so this is negative 60. If you don't tell me, my friends in chemistry, the negative sign gives me directionality. So this is negative 60. It tells me what? The N and it's got a unit. Let's put a unit there. Usually it's kilojoules. So let's pretend it's KJs in the house. Okay. Now, so my friends in chemistry, what does this mean? Well, if these were the actual numbers, and they're not, instead of putting E here, I would put 60 kilojoules. Why would you put negative 60? Ah, it's a great question. Energy can only be positive. This is the energy that's released. This is the change of energy. So energy will always be positive in your reaction, but the change could be negative. Delta H and the energy, although the same numerals, you'll have to get a negative if something is exothermic. So I can say to you, this reaction has a delta H equal to negative 60 kilojoules, KJ right here, and you would say because it's negative, it's exothermic. Why negative? Because the energy went down. Why? Because it was released. Why? Because heat was released. Yes? How do you know when it's endothermic? I'm going to get to that, okay? I'm going to give you that. So if something is exothermic, Heat was released, your change in overall where you start goes down, that's why you get the negative, and this is important, the temperature in the environment does what? Come on, use your common sense. I just burned something. It has to increase. Temperature increases all the time, there's no exceptions. So if I have an exothermic reaction, my environment gets warmer. Why? Because the energy that was in the bonds stored the potential energy became less in the chemical reaction and the difference was given off. So far so good? Okay. If you look at a potential energy curve, you're almost home. Okay? Except you're not. So, let's make sure we know the difference here. So this, my friends, is the energy of my reactants. This is the 
potential energy, the PE of the reactants. This is the potential energy of my products. Definitely have to be lower. And here's a Regents question. When a reaction is exothermic, what, who is more stable? the products or the reactants when a reaction is exothermic. The products are more stable because they have low energy. And if you forgot that, say, oh, exothermic. I'm starting high, going low. Oh, clearly the products are lower in energy. You have to understand that low energy is stable, right? The guy in the city who is, has high, high energy, okay, he's unstable. Don't know what he's going to do. Things are convert, okay? Now, we're not done, because if you notice something, based on what I just drew, this should become this all the time. Right now, this should be burning. The paper on your desk would be burning. Anything that could burn would burn, baby, burn! Okay? But it's not. Okay. Now, why isn't it burning? Someone just tell me told me, you need activation energy. What was my demonstration about? What started the reaction? A little cute little spark. Okay? This little spark started the reaction. And it's called activation energy. And it's also called an energy barrier. Watch. If I was to plot the changes in potential energy, here is my new thing right here. Watch party people. I'm going to go from here and down. This represents an energy barrier. Now, the first thing you look at at one of these curves, how do I start? How do I finish? I'm going down. Energy must be released. The second thing you look at, what's my change? My change drops, so it should be negative, it's exothermic. Now, this represents an energy barrier. The reason why the paper is not burning, okay, the roof is not on fire. We don't need any water, okay? Now, the reason why it's not burning is because there's an energy barrier here. We need to have some energy to start the reaction. Now the question is, I can just tell you that or explain why. For a reaction to occur, a physical collision has to occur. Think about this, okay? I have to have molecule A slam in to molecule B. There has to be a physical collision. Now, what do we know about the outside of molecules? What do we know? What is in the outside of atoms? What's on the outside of atoms? It rhymes with electron, exactly. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear you. So A has electrons on the outside. This is not a bright idea, Volt. Okay? B has electrons cloud as well. So when these guys try to come together, okay, they have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. The problem is they're going to repel. They have electrons on the outermost. So once these guys, in order for them to react, they have to collide. So my friends in chemistry, what happens is they're repelling each other. So you need exactly this amount of energy to overcome these repulsive forces. So they have to collide with a high enough kinetic energy speed to overcome those repulsive forces. What is that energy? Well, it's plotted here, and it's got a fancy word, so pinky up, it's called activation energy. So this value right here, I'm gonna change to magenta, don't get nuts, the difference of here all the way to the top, to the tippy top. This is called your activation energy. It's the energy needed to push these molecules together. And it's a good thing we have it because anything that could explode 
or burn would already be doing so. Yes? Besides, like, the spark or, like, sound, what would be, like, in a Heat. Thermal energy could be enough. It's called a flashpoint. A lot of these things have flashpoints. So I put this on a hot plate. The heat enough would be, you vibrate them enough, it could be enough to cause a reaction. So heat, sparks, um, electrical impulse, anything that's a, a source of energy. Okay, sometimes just wind, some touching. I've done some reactions where I can use a feather to start a reaction just by moving it with a feather. Just motion. That must mean the what? The activation energy is small and this substance is really unstable. So any type of energy can start a reaction. It has to be physical uh, Yes, because you're talking about what? Physically helping these guys push together. But that could be electrical, it could be thermal, many forms. As long as you're helping them push them together. So this is the activation energy of the forward. Now, this little magenta spot is the highest point. Let me explain what this is. I'm pushing A and B together. Their maximum repulsive distance, or, or we put B closer. This is the point of no return. They get so close, they're almost bonded or almost at the point where they can react. We call this a complex, an activated complex. Why is it activated? A lot of energy was used to get them to this exact position where they're about ready to react. Sometimes they will react or they'll just break apart into something else. So we call this the activated complex. So from the top of that line all the way down is the activated complex. Looks like it's a, some, some guy here, but it's an activated complex. It's the highest energy position. Activated complex. It's this value here. Now, what kind of analogy can I help you remember this? Well, I love slides. We drive by a park as a family, ah, we stop, we've got to ride that slide. Um, we're all about slides. Okay? I love to go on slides. Now the problem with slides though, unless you're really lazy, is you have to climb them. In order to ride the slide, you've got to climb the slide. Okay? So the reaction, if the same analogy is true, you need to add energy to get to the tippy top. Once you get past this point, didn't expect it. Back to being professional. Now, I won't do that again. Once you get to the top, okay, get the reaction. Once you pass this point of no return, you have a reaction that will go. So activation energy is needed to get past this activated complex point. This is the energy, maximum repulsive force. Think about it. Me and Jordan, we're fine right now. Energy's building up. Energy's building up. Getting awkward. High energy. Get out of my space. That's kind of the same kind of deal. I'm glad you didn't kick me there. Okay? <laughs> but same kind of deal. All right? Now, what do you think this, if I went in the reverse reaction, here's your question. If I went in the reverse, if it's exothermic in the forward, what do you think it is in the reverse? Endothermic. I'm starting low. These are now my what? Reactants. These are now my products. And watch. What's my delta H? It's still 60, right? But what's the sign? Plus, because I'm going up in the reverse. Up in here. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. All right. <laughs> okay, bad references all the way around. But what would be this value here? What would be this value from the top of the peak, oops, all the way down? What would be this value right here? What would be the amount of energy in the reverse to get to the top position and beyond? It'd be definitely more than 60, but what do we call it? What's the energy needed to overcome the energy barrier that prevents the reaction from going, with good reason. What was in the forward direction? It was the activation energy in the forward. This is now the activation energy of the reverse. Crisscross, everyone up there? Sorry, all right. All about pop music, today, whatever. So yeah, this is the activation energy of the reverse. Everyone with me? 
Okay, so if you know something is exothermic in the forward, you know it's what in the reverse? Now, what would that be? What would that look like? Now, my party people, watch. What would it look like? Very important. Here's my same reaction, but now I'm going to write it in reverse. I've got CO2, four of them, still balanced, six water gas molecules becoming, well, with six O2s, becoming two C6H6Os. But where would the heat go? It's now endothermic. Endothermic means I'm starting low and I'm going higher. How can I go low and go higher? How can I have more energy at the end than the beginning? What must I be doing if I'm going low to go to high? I must be taking in energy. The reactants need energy. You'd put the energy, in this case it still would be what? 60 kilojoules. It would go in the reactant side. So if it's exothermic, what's the curve look like? High going to low. If it's endothermic, like this one, it looks like what? L low going to high. This one, you're biting off a bomb. All this energy's missing. It was released. Here you're creating a bomb. <coughs> energy's what? Absorbed. Exo. Endo. Think about things in our environment. As I was sunbathing yesterday, I was thinking about photosynthesis. Why wouldn't you? Okay, the grass is getting greener. You all were doing the same, I'm sure. What's the grass doing? It's taking the sun's energy and creating carbohydrates. Hey, it's creating chemicals that have stored energy. What do we do as consumers? We eat that sucker to get energy. Why do we feel warm? Because we're alive? Yes, I know we feel warm because we're taking the carbohydrates made from the plants and we're burning them. It's an important cycle. Endothermic, as the grass sits there and takes in the energy, we eat the grass. Well, the cow eats the grass, I guess, and then we slaughter the cow. In any case, uh, it's the same combo. All right, so it's important. So there is a exothermic curve, heats on the product side, endo heats on the reactant side. This makes the temperature in the environment do what? As I burn something, as I release heat, go up. This needs energy. So it's taking energy from the environment, so the temperature does what? Okay. It goes down, that's important. Okay, now I got one little piece to this and we're done with this major understanding. The catalyst. We all know the catalyst speed up reactions. You may not know why. And there's two reasons why. A catalyst, okay, finds an alternative pathway. Normally, reactions don't occur in one step. They occur in many steps. That's something I would talk about in AP Chem. But what it would do is it would find an alternative pathway to get to this position that's lower in energy. So a catalyst, if it's effective, would find a new pathway and it would lower this hump. Now notice it, does it change where, you, where I start and finish? No, it does not. So the catalyst lowers the what? By lowering the hump, it's lowering the amount of energy barrier that prevents the reaction from going. Think of me in my slides again. Me and Jordan are going to have a race. We're going to see who can ride the slide as many times as possible. Now, he's going to have a high slide, like 10 meters. I'm going to have a short slide. I basically just step over and slide, step over, slide. OK. The point being, in 10 minutes, I'm going to have a lot more slides ridden because, or more rides ridden on the slide, whatever, because he has to climb a what? Much higher slide. If you lower the energy needed for the reaction to start, lower the energy needed to push the molecules together, for the same amount of energy, more reactants will collide. Okay? So, activation energy is lower. Now, think with me for a second. I think of this like medicating a pimple. Or, okay? Or a blackhead. Okay? Now, this is the catalyzed, the medicated. This is the uncatalyzed, the unmedicated. 
Medicated catalyzed. Unmedicated. Uncatalyzed. Okay. <laughs> right? Stop taking that. All right. Now, what happened to this line here? <laughs> I love Sarah. She's so quiet. All of a sudden, she's burst out. I don't know. I don't know. Must see YouTube TV, I guess. <laughs> She's laughing so hard, she'll laugh at anything. Right, watch this. Look at this. See? Um, Glasses? Okay. Almost done. Okay, so activation energy gets what? Lowered. Okay? The activated complex get lowered with a catalyst. All right? Now, a catalyst also helps, like with enzymes, exposing the second piece of um, the, something called an effective collision, which I'll get to another day. So let's stop here. These are all the important parts, and then we're going to take a, take a worksheet out and review with me in a second. So I'll take a break right now. Let's make a second.